As the nights lengthen, the days shorten. It's not surprising that so many religious and cultural traditions celebrate festivals of light during this time of year. Hindus, Jains, Sikhs, and some Buddhists celebrated Diwali a few weeks ago by lighting lamps and candles to celebrate the victory of good or evil. And in a couple of months, many of those who celebrate the New Year will symbolize new beginnings with lanterns. And many Christians, including this church, who observe Advent, light four candles representing hope, peace, joy, and love. Today's candle, the second week, by the way, is the candle for peace. And so I invite you to pray for peace in our world as you see the candles light and wreath here in church today or in your home. For our Jewish friends, Hanukkah, the festival of lights, began on Thursday and is marked by the lighting of eight candles on the menorah. Now, here in the United States, we're often used to seeing uh, displays of religious observance in the public sphere, including uh, in the White House, as our president celebrates the diverse tapestry of faith in our land, a mark of various religious holidays. But that is not the case in France, where la cité, strict secularism on the part of the state, is revered by all sides of the political spectrum. And so it was that President Emmanuel Macron <coughs> found himself in a bit of a maelstrom this week when he hosted an event in the presidential palace in which the chief rabbi of France lit the first candle of a Hanukkah menorah. The response was unified outrage across the country, even among many Jewish leaders, who said that secularism is the best way to ensure the freedom of all people in society to practice their religion. In response, President Macron argued that he had not, in fact, broken the sanctity of secularism because lighting a menorah is not really a religious act. That came as quite a surprise to millions of Jewish people <laughs> for whom Hanukkah is a religious holiday, intimately connected to ancient Israel's struggle for self-determination and freedom of faith. Hanukkah's origins are in the Maccabean revolt of the second century BCE. The people of Israel lived under the rule of a foreign empire, not for the first time and not for the last time. Their rulers at the time were the Hellenistic Seleucids, who had generally allowed the Jewish people to exercise their religion and customs in exchange for obedience. But perhaps because of a conflict between different Jewish religious groups, a new king changed the former policy of religious toleration and desecrated the temple in Jerusalem. Among his many abominations, he took away the light he snuffed out the sacred fire of the everlasting flame, which represented God's presence, God's eternal presence with the Jewish people. And for good measure, he stole the lampstand, too. <laughs> A group of rebels called the Maccabees decided to challenge the forces of empire, and improbably, they won. They found oil to light the sacred lamps once again, but there was only enough for one day. Yet the fire burned for eight days until new supplies could be found. And that's why there are eight candles on the Hanukkah menorah. Unfortunately, the new rulers of Jerusalem, the Hasmoneans, were not particularly enlightened humanitarians either. And they continued their conflict, waging a war for religious orthodoxy, even among their fellow Jewish people. Leading by civil war, Eventually, the Hasmonean rule fell to the Roman Empire, which set up the Herodian dynasty to rule over the lands that had once been united under King David. The new imperial regime in Rome established what they called the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. And it was a remarkable feat to keep much of the Mediterranean and ancient Near Eastern world free from full-scale wars for such, a, for such a long period of time allowing commerce and culture to flourish. But this peace was not always peace for those who lived under imperial rule. Rome's impressive military might was required to keep that peace, and if anyone challenged it, they were met with brutal violence. As theologian Kelly Vikrandeha writes in the first advent of Palestine, this oppression altered taxes to Herod and tithes to 
for the temple, all created debt. With new systems of bad faith loans offered by speculators, this world of peace is a world of foreclosures, evicting families from the land, often turning them into tenant farmers of their own property. Economic loss separated families, caused malnutrition in children, and left many women widowed and vulnerable. What looked to a few people a means like the world of peace kept most of the population in a constant position of economic stress by imperial design. It was into this context of oppressive peace and inequitable prosperity that Jesus would be born. And it was into this context that John the baptizer followed in the prophetic tradition, calling for the people to wait with eager expectation for the coming of a Messiah. In fact, as we hear in today's gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is directly connected to that prophetic call for a new world. The very first words of Mark's gospel are the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the next line is, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, the prophets of Israel responded to the suffering of their people by casting a vision for a world where righteousness and peace have kissed one another, where truth and mercy have met together. And this world, this world of righteousness, peace, truth, and mercy, is one in which would be even more powerful than military might. And John the Baptist followed in this prophetic <coughs> tradition. And if the good news of Jesus Christ emerges out of that prophetic call for a redeemed world, then as Kelly Nicodema writes, perhaps the first advent was God's critique of what the world called peace. Comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. We live in a world where conflicts rage in Ukraine, a democracy invaded by its authoritarian neighbor, to Palestine and Israel, enmeshed in rivalries both ancient and modern, and to many other conflicts in the Middle East, Asia, and Africa. What is remarkable about the current state of affairs around the world is not actually that there are several active conflicts. That is nothing new. What is really more remarkable is that most people in the world actually live in relative peace. Many scholars argue that the world has never been more at peace than it is now, and that people are less likely to die by violence now than any time in the past. And certainly here in the United States, we've benefited greatly from the so-called Pax Americana. And yet, the peace we experience here in the U.S. today, and many people around the world experience, is not peace for those left behind in wars and other places, and also those left behind in these very societies that themselves seem to be peace, where people experience poverty, homelessness, hunger, and other forces of inequality. And we're even, in this morning's news headlines, we read that at gun buyback and uh, drop-off centers, those guns have been taken, and part of them melted down, but then the rest of them actually sold back on the market to create more weapons of violence. Such things have to stop. And the good news of Jesus Christ, emerging from the prophetic call for justice, is that a new day is dawning. It may take a while, but it will come. And that's the message of Advent. Many of us look to Jesus and find hope in very personal ways, but freedom in Christ is not only spiritual and individual, but also material and communal. As theologian Nick Vega writes in Advent, we learn that God is always coming to our troubled times. And I would add that the promise of Advent is that God comes to us as one of us. First and foremost, Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. But also, remember that God acts through each and every one of us. And that together, we will build this new world prophets call for. Comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. Earlier this week I attended the Diocese of New Jersey clergy conference along with Deacon Gale and Deacon Carolyn. And in one of the services we sang the Advent hymn that we just sang here in church, Comfort, Comfort ye my people. As we sang that in the conference 
on Tuesday night, we part in mind we're back home at Trinity thinking of our Code Blue Winter Warming Center, which would open that night this season. During winter months when the temperature drops below freezing, Trinity opens up to receive guests, offering them a warm place to rest, escape the cold, and enjoy some food and fellowship. We are currently the only drop-in center where people can come at any hour of the night in the entire county, and in fact, the only warming center at all in our shore communities. And so when I returned from the conference on Wednesday, I was glad to have the opportunity to come and see the program in action and to meet some of our guests, who, I call them guests, but they're just as much a part of this Trinity community as you or me sitting here in church today. And in fact, there is overlap. People here who come to church are also people who are sleeping in the gym uh, on winter nights. People I met were so grateful for the hospitality. And as I've talked to guests and looked around at people resting, eating, talking, and watching the movie, my heart was really just bursting, bursting love and gratitude for this church, for Trinity. And I want to thank all of you for making this possible through your donations, your time as volunteers, and by your participation in this worshiping fellowship. Because you are the people of Trinity Church. Without you, this spiritual community would not exist. And without the spiritual community of Trinity Church, none of the good work that happens on the grounds of Trinity Church would exist. Sunday morning worship is the beating heart of all we do here at Trinity. As it makes everything else possible. As we find our place at the table and become part of the body of Christ, we are also called to go out into the world and share God's love. And Code Blue is a tangible expression of God's love and light working through us. It is but a single candle in a single place, but it is a part of a greater thing, shining hope and freedom to a world in need. As we light our candle here at Trinity, we join the constellation of lights in God's great work of liberation. Comfort, oh comfort my people, session God, what could be more basic than a warm place to rest on a cold winter's night? And so I hope you'll sign up for a four-hour shift sometime so you too can spend a little time with the guests and see the difference this church, your church, is making in people's lives. If you can't volunteer, perhaps you might participate by sharing some food or spreading the word about our Code Blue program to your friends, colleagues, and neighbors. Someone might be inspired to help out, and you never know also who you might encounter who might need a place to stay at night. Finally, please remember to pray for the guests of our Code Blue program, our fellow community members. Years ago, I learned to pray not just for the needs of others, but for the needs and possibilities of others. And I commend this prayer to you, too. We are called to comfort God's people. But those we help just might comfort us too. Not today, but tomorrow. In this Advent season, be the light. Be one candle. And then look for the light. Look for the light shining in the faces of all those around us. In this light. The light we create together. We will find God's peace.